Thanks everybody so much for being here. This is a really, really special day. And with that, I will turn things over to the fabulous Dr. Shaquita Bell, who's gonna introduce our lectureship and our guest speaker for today. Thank you all for being here. We're really excited to have Dr. Devon uh, join us. I'm gonna start with this beautiful picture of Othello. This is our clinic that is our second location that is opening in March, and we could not be more excited to have uh, the ability to reach more children and to move farther south to follow our community. And we're just really looking forward to it. I hope all of you get to visit it soon. We uh, have this annual lecture in honor of Dr. Blanche Lovizo. Um, she was born in Atlanta, Georgia in on July 11th, 1925, and she was a friend and schoolmate of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She graduated from Spelman College in 1946 and then from Meharry Medical College in 1950. In 1975, she received a master's in public health from the University of Washington. And in 1991, uh, she became um, the, oh, I don't know why that switched over. Sorry about that. Um, she uh, helped to be our very first uh, medical director at the Odessa Brown Clinic in 1970, excuse me. Um, and uh, we have a name, uh, we have a park that's named after her, uh, formerly known as the Yesler Atlantic Pedestrian Pathway, is now the Dr. Blanche Lovizo Park. And in 1995, a water play area was added to that park. Um, we could not be the clinic we are without her guidance. She is the person who gave us our founding mission that lives on today, Quality Care with Dignity. And I think she would be very excited in particular to have our speaker today. So Dr. Debon is our invited guest lecturer and we could not be more excited about having him. He's a professor of pediatrics and medicine at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. Uh, he's the JC Peterson Endowed Chair and he's the founder and director of Vanderbilt Meharry Sickle Cell Center. Sickle Cell Disease Center of Excellence. Uh, for over 25 years, his research on sickle cell disease has led to fundamental changes in understanding of the clinical epidemiology, pathogenesis, and treatment of strokes and silent strokes in children and adults with sickle cell disease. He's been the principal investigator and co-leader on eight NIH found, uh, foundation funded controlled clinical trials and designed to prevent strokes in children and adults with sickle cell disease in North America, Europe, and Nigeria. Um, I chose these uh, snapshots, uh, Dr. Devon, because I Googled you um, and the ACSH came up and the PubMed. I just wanted to demonstrate, I don't know if anybody can see that, but it's one of 30 pages of your prolific work. But one of the things that was really apropos of, of having you come to speak to us today is when this headline uh, reached my inbox about a month ago. And I was grabbed, obviously, by the picture in the headline. But as I read on, um, I don't know, hopefully you're aware of this, but the New York Times was featuring some of your work in Nigeria. And it was a really um, beautiful and uh, uh, kismet way to um, celebrate your being here today. And uh, we're very excited to have you. You know, it's always a little daunting when people start uh, citing you telling you about your work, you want to kind of look, sit back and listen to somebody else talk. But in this case, I'm on the spot. And so I will uh, do my best to uh, share with you this journey that I have uh, enjoyed on for some time. This is a, an important topic for me. And that's uh, this concept of academic activism. It's a term I coined on, uh, two decades ago. And uh, I remember talking to my daughter about this, who's now in her mid thirties, and she felt that I was being a little bit too caustic um, with this terminology. And um, anybody who is aware, my daughter is Morgan Devon, and it turns out she's a little bit more uh, in your face now than I am. So um, the goal here is to talk about my experience uh, in medical school, uh, my experience as junior faculty, my lit my uh, mid-level faculty experience. I had uh, the traditional um, midlife crises uh, when I hit 50. And then uh, to describe to you what's gonna happen um, as I turn into the uh, winter season of my career. Let me tell you about what this, uh, what my journey has been about. So this issue of academic activism. Uh, when I started off as a medical student at, uh, at Stanford, I graduated from Howard. And uh, for those who know anything about Howard, 
uh, it's a historical black school. And uh, that in and of itself was very empowering for me as a student who grew up predominantly in the African-American community and uh, had my, uh, my sense of self-esteem as a young black man affirmed as opposed to being challenged. And so when I left Howard, I felt as if I could change the world. And uh, I went to medical school in Stanford uh, for a range of reasons. Uh, and while I was there, I made it my responsibility uh, to look for people who were like me. And um, in that journey, um, I identified a medical student while I was on the admissions committee at Stanford who uh, was, uh, had done well on his MCAT. Um, his grade point average was not as high as the highest grade point average you could have. Uh, however, he was um, a student at Howard who had worked his way through undergraduate school as a full-time employee of a band. I don't know if anybody's from DC area, but he was in a DC go-go band like Chuck Brown. And he played the bass and that's how he supported himself. He was the first one from his family, not to finish from college, but for fin to finish from high school. And um, I uh, called him up and said, hey, you know, I think you'd be a great fit here at Stanford. Why don't you think about uh, applying? And he applied and of course he didn't have any resources to fly up from DC to Stanford. And so um, the admissions office uh, paid for him to come to Stanford for his interview. And my wife and I picked him up uh, from the airport and, um, and it was his first plane ride. And all of the type of acculturation that we all have had, or many of us had, in going and preparing for medical school. Uh, uh, my buddy, or at the, or the student at the time, had none of that. Um, and that, in fact, was uh, uh, a challenge. So we had to kind of redress him because he looked like, I don't know if you, any of you all remember Saturday Night Live. He looked like he was in a Saturday Night Live outfit um, with a very skinny tie and, um, you know, fancy socks with... Um, loafer shoes and the like. And so um, we got everything together and he went and had his interviews for two days. And um, the end result of that process uh, was that um, he did not get accepted into medical school. Now I was, again, um, uh, very uh, ambitious in kind of Don Quixote-like. So I went to the head of the medical school and I said, well, why didn't this young man get in? And it turns out that I was able to look at his file and the, what sunk his application uh, was in fact this uh, comment by one of the uh, medical school interviewers who um, said that he did not have ambition. And so I understood the context of that uh, statement because when I talked to my buddy, I said, well, you know, how did the interviews go? And he said, well, there was this guy, you kept pressing me, you kept pressing me. I said, what did he press you about? He said, he kept pressing me about uh, why, what was my least favorite subject? And so I said, I don't really have one. I said, I had to take Spanish. So I guess I would say Spanish. And so that comment was interpreted on his interview as someone who had no ambition to learn a foreign language and travel abroad uh, to Europe to learn Spanish. So I uh, was living and I ended up uh, appealing to the head of the uh, admissions department. And I was a medical student myself at this time. And I said, how can you allow this to occur? And uh, the head of the medical school admission uh, said to me, uh, you know, this is outside of my area of jurisdiction. You have to go to the person who runs the faculty senate um for stanford so i went to a guy who was uh, a wonderful world-renowned oncologist and i basically um in no uncertain terms said that if you don't let this young man in medical school i was that direct probably even less eloquent uh, then your decision to let me into this medical school was a mistake now i had a few leverage points because i was doing very well at stanford and so there was a frame of reference and the ultimate was that he was accepted into medical school and uh, he uh, excelled as a medical student at Stanford, received one of the few neurosurgery awards uh, for medical students to do a one-year um, pullout uh, program for research. 
and uh, got his number one choice to be a neurosurgeon and is currently a neurosurgeon um, and has done extremely well in his chosen profession. So um, what did I learn in that process? And uh, what I learned was that I had spent an exorbitant amount of ATP um, fighting for a, a singular cause uh, for a single individual. And I had no allies, none. Uh, this was me fighting against the system. And I was in medical school trying to do my best. And I, I ultimately made a decision. Um, and at this process of me going up against the system, I continued to, to uh, push that agenda for challenges that I saw. And uh, it was uh, very draining. I did this as a resident. Uh, and ultimately, I made a decision that um, I needed to trans uh, uh, port myself from this I to a we. Uh, because if I wanted to have a, a real footprint on effecting change, then I would need to uh, identify a better approach where I surrounded myself with people who had ideas that were aligned to my ideas and so that we could work together. So uh, this was a, a, a critical uh, transformation in my man mindset from being a medical student and a resident that was feeling like I, it was me against the world um, to identify individuals who had like minds and similar ideas to move forward. So um, I'm gonna bypass my residency, chief residency and HEMOC fellowship and bypass my second fellowship as a US Public Health Service Epidemiology Fellow and come back to uh, Wash U, um, St. Louis Children's Hospital, where I was recruited as an assistant professor of pediatrics and focused specifically on uh, children with cancer and children with blood disease. And so uh, during that um, initial faculty appointment in 1996, I uh, in, also as the clinical director for the Division of Hematology and Oncology. And for the oncologists out there, I was actually the site investigator for uh, our POG group, similar to CCG. And we had direct funding from the NCI because we had such a strong scientific group at Wash U at the time. So uh, I, at that point, I was learning the status quo. I really didn't understand the ebb and flow of a complex academic center. And that was a problem, that was a real problem. Uh, because it, when you're the junior faculty and you come in with this ambition to want to change um, the environment for our children, uh, be they children with cancer or children with cancer predisposition syndromes or children with sickle cell disease, then you have to really understand the landscape of the environment in which you work in. And I was truly, despite being a resident there for five years, a chief resident fellow and feeling like I knew everyone, I didn't understand the political landscape of an academic institution. So what I ended up doing was um, uh, taking data in. And as part of the data that I was taking in, I included the ability for me to assess the disparity in care. And I would uh, submit to you that there's no bigger disparity of care in a department of pediatrics, division of hemonc, than the care that children with sickle cell disease receive and the care that children with cancer receive. And I can say this categorically as a former oncologist who had the responsibility of taking care of children with cancer. So in the same division, I had a situation where we had at least five camps for children with cancer. And we had camps for children with, who were teenagers with cancer, who we would take them on a field trip sponsored by philanthropy to either coast uh, to enjoy their life as a teenager. We also had cancer for, uh, camps for children under five, uh, where the whole family could go as a family retreat. And on a given day when the child with cancer had a birthday, we had presents galore and a birthday cake in the clinic on the same day that a child with sickle cell disease would be seen who had their birthday on the same day. So um, this was a real challenge. And so what I ended up doing uh, first thing was I resigned as a clinical director because I couldn't really focus as much on my research and the population that I wanted to care for um, with all of my energy, 
which was this population of children with and adults with young adults with sickle cell disease. And then I started to build a coalition around uh, how do I manage this population in a way that improves their care. And the first strategy that I wanted to address uh, was the strategy of uh, camp, because for our families, this was important. So luckily for myself, I, I grew up in St. Louis. I knew I had contacts with people outside of the medical center, which was very valuable. The medical center actually didn't care what I did at that point, which was extremely valuable. So I did external fundraising within the community using old fashioned sweat equity. I had uh, colleagues who I went to uh, high school with who had uh, resources, who they donated money. And this is how we bootstrapped the first camp for children with sickle cell disease in St. Louis. Um, we did this um, for nine years. I was the camp director, the social, I'm sorry, the social worker was the camp director. I was the medical director, slept every night at the camp, learned all about nocturnal enuresis and children with sickle cell disease. If you look in my bio sketch, you'll see I have about two or three articles on nocturnal enuresis. It is a big problem to have um, bedwetting at a camp and not be prepared. Uh, let me just tell you, um, it is a real challenge. So, um, and quite frankly, the camp that we were at probably needed to be condemned. It was one of these camps that was closed down, but because it was uh, had such a important purpose for children who were underserved in the city, they kept it open, um, but it, it never would have passed inspection. It, literally, when the girls flushed the toilet, there was a shock that went through the, the bathroom uh, every time they flushed it. Despite all of that, the children had a wonderful time, and we enjoyed it. Uh, we kept the camp going for nine years, and it wasn't until the 10th year of the camp as a faculty member when some of the nurses that I knew as a fellow and res as a resident and fellow ended up um, uh, as a hospital starter to support other camps for children with chronic diseases. They said, well, why are you not supporting this camp with sickle cell disease? It was actually nurses who were now in leadership um, who said, wait a minute, this camp has been going on for nine years. They are deserving of the same resources as the other children with a chronic disease. And so they set up a camp uh, fund specifically for children with sickle cell disease. And that was in 2010. And that has been continuing down every year since 2021. So that's the first la layer of inequity that I saw and was able to try to address. The second is this issue um, around um, blood transfusion therapy. So it turns out that um, if you don't know, um, at the time, and even now today, the majority of blood that's donated in the United States is from um, white population, non-Black, um, non-Hispanic, non-Asian. There's a, a, a tradition for why this is the case. And that tradition is primarily based on the fact that when blood bank donations were set up in the um, mid 40s, uh, there were separate blood banks for whites and blacks. And in fact, I had a cartoon that demonstrated that there were war vet, there were individuals in war, um, in World War II, I should say, who would not get blood from someone else uh, of a different color. Specifically, the white soldiers would not take blood from a black soldier, even if they were dying um, from shock, this was not an acceptable uh, medical practice. I mean, can you imagine physicians separating blood and then having someone in shock and not agreeing to provide them blood because it came from a black man or a black woman. This is actually the case for the American Red Cross. So that tradition of not having blood drives in the African American community, not celebrating blood donation as a civic responsibility in our community is still a vestige of our current blood donation rates in the United States, uh, where you have a disproportionate number of um, uh, European people of European descent and few people of African descent or Hispanic descent or Asian descent are volunteering to donate blood. So I have um, I reached out specifically to my um, uh, the American Red Cross. And well, let me just hit pause. So why is this important? It's important because the only antidote for children who have a stroke and the children with sickle cell disease, this is pre-TCD, about 11% of the children with sickle cell disease will have a stroke before their 18th birthday. And as a result of that, the only way to prevent the stroke is with blood transfusion therapy. And so, and this is on a monthly basis. And you can imagine if you have red blood cells, despite the, the uh, mislabeling of blood as black and white, we do know that the minor red blood cell antigens track based on ancestry. And 
if you have donors who are predominantly white and recipients who are predominantly black, then you will have uh, inevitably a high rate of red blood cell alleyimmunization, which will result in those children not being able to receive blood on a regular basis. And when they become adults, being almost impossible to transfuse. And so you take truly one of the few opportunities to prevent or to treat uh, children and adults with life-threatening complications of sickle cell disease. Uh, you take that option off the table if they're alleyimmunized. So I decided that we would set up the African-American blood donation program in St. Louis, uh, referred to as the Charles Drew um, Blood Donor Campaign. And this campaign was directly focused on improving blood donation in the African-American community. Now, I, I, this, is, this whole topic is an hour of discussion in and of itself. And I, I will briefly just give you the highlights. Roughly, we went from, first of all, American Red Cross prior to like, uh, 2000, uh, 1996, 94, 95, they actually didn't actually collect the data on where the blood units were coming from. So they had very lim limited knowledge of the demographics of the people who were coming in. Now you could say that's a good thing because all the blood is, is um, doesn't matter where they come from, but it's actually bad because it means all their marketing strategies for how to improve blood donation were not targeted for people of color specifically in St. Louis, which was biracial. It's either black or white. There's very few Asians, very few Hispanics in St. Louis during this window of time. Uh, there was no campaign to educate African-Americans about the importance of blood donation. So, and this is particularly bad for our children and adults with sickle cell disease because that's where they needed the blood. And so we set up a program to have a directed donor program for blood donation uh, with the idea that we would improve, uh, decrease the alloimmunization rate and improve the number of volunteers in the African-American community um, by just educating them. It was a major campaign, uh, actually had an R on one focused on blood donation and core blood donation in the African-American community after we had uh, jump-started this process. We went from roughly 3,700 units of uh, African-American blood in St. Louis uh, to over 17,000 uh, African-American uh, units of blood over the course of about five years. We dramatically increased the rate of, of first-time blood donors in the African-American community. Uh, American Red Cross became a partner to understand the uh, challenges of sickle cell disease in the community. They set up a donor uh, uh, recipient um, breakfast once a year honoring the donors. And ironically, um, probably no surprise to folks who study genetics, uh, probably half of the room were whites, not blacks. Uh, it was real testimony to uh, if you educate the community uh, and you explain to them the importance of blood donation in our community, um, they will show up. And in fact, we had a program called Sickle Cell Sabbath where we would go to the churches in the St. Louis region on uh, a specific uh, Sunday during the year, usually the first month or the second month of, uh, of the year, February, and we go through, um, through April, uh, again, educating the African-American community about blood donation in the and the importance of knowing your sickle cell trait status. So I, I'm going to hit pause and stop, uh, just so I make sure you all are out there listening to me, see if there's any questions about my experience at Stanford and my experience at um, uh, my first few years at, at uh, St. Louis Children's Hospital, Wash U, where I had this um, challenge of uh, learning the status quo and making some decisions about the camp and um, blood donation. Um, I have a question. I'm listening. Can you hear? Okay, sorry. Yes. Um, thank, thank you so much for this talk. Um, this is, uh, I think, really pertinent, especially I'm an intern here, um, and I see those kind of kind of inequities at our institution as well um, regarding um, just treating our sickle cell patients and the kind of focus and comfort with more oncology patients rather than those. Uh, that, that other population um, and it not only tremendously affects patient care but also our education is not up to par um, in being able to treat these patients as well um, as an intern who feels like uh, not really able to navigate the system as well how do you how do you go about kind of um, going to higher levels of hospital admin to advocate for um, improved systemic um, changes <laughs> when yeah. uh, when you you yourself are not exactly, you know, up to par on the system as well. Yeah, so, you know, uh, 
So this is a very challenging answer, okay? And I want to be direct. Um, I, uh, I understand where leverage is in an academic setting. And I think all of us understand where it is. And um, I was in a medical school that was all about meritocracy. And meritocracy was not how good of a doc are you? How well of a history can you elicit from a five-year-old to determine whether or not they have asthma? How you identify uh, the child with malnutrition because the mother is embarrassed to get um, weak. Uh, those are wonderful skills. And as a clinician, we all celebrate individuals who have those skills or the clinician who can make that undiagnosed rare genetic disease. We celebrate that, but uh, very few medical centers actually um, celebrate that with leverage to change the system. And, um, and so uh, I was fortunate that uh, the system that I was in was a meritocracy. And basically, if you can go out and do it, they, would, they didn't say no. So as long as I went out and raised money myself for the children with sickle cell disease for this camp, and I staffed it with the team who were extramurally funded, again, it's me hustling to make the money, um, then they couldn't say no. And in fact, um, I'll give you a very explicit example. Um, you know, here we have, we, at the time we were averaging about 200, mm, 250 children with cancer. And um, we had children with uh, uh, transplants uh, around, eh, not a big unit, maybe 30 trans, maybe 20 transplants a year at the time. And, um, and I went to the leadership and said, where is my social worker for children with sickle cell disease? Now here I am the clinical director and I'm asking for a social worker. I got two social workers for cancer, one social worker for children with uh, transplant and no social worker for children with sickle cell disease. Now at that time in St. Louis, 70% of our patients were on Medicaid and the other 20% were working poor and 10% were not. So we're talking extremely poor in St. Louis. And the answer is your children will receive social work as a reaction uh, to their problem, not as anticipatory. Now you could, Try over spilled milk and jump up and down and tell everybody how wrong that is, but nobody's listening. They they know this. They, 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 everybody knows this problem. So I did what I had learned to do with my uh, education. I wrote grants. So I wrote a grant uh, to uh, hire an educational liaison. That was the title of the position. It was on soft money and, uh, and we got the grant. And that was actually a, a, a master's level social worker who had tremendous experience at St. Jude and working with this population and children with cancer. And then I leveraged that opportunity with the grant and she became best in class of all the social workers in the Department of Social Work at St. Louis Children's Hospital. She had multiple publications, first author, presented at national meetings, and had people travel from around the country to come to see how she was setting up her program. So when the funding ran out, guess what? They couldn't fire her. Her evaluations were a <laughs> long fold greater than everybody else. They haven't been a social worker in the group in 20 years that has published since she has. So, yeah, and I can give you chapter and verse of how we had to do this at Vanderbilt when I came here as well, right? You know, almost, almost identical story on the adult side. Didn't have a nurse case manager. Didn't have a nurse practitioner to work with the adult uh, provider. Dr. Kasim, Editor Kasim, my adult provider on, um, for the sickle cell center, I mean, our, he's the adult provider. He, he was handling all his patients with sickle cell disease like he was in private practice. You come in to see him, he would tell you what to do, and then you go out. But the whole process of how you manage a patient using the Ed Wagner chronic care model, and you're, you're an internist, you know about this Ed Wagner chronic care model. So this is a very important model for care. It's a model of care where the epicenter of care is actually with the nurse. And it, it evolves around actively engaging the patient in their own care, 
providing them with tools so that they can be engaged and know how to manage their care when they see you. The, the focus is all the care in between the visit, not at the time of the visit. The physician is actually the least important person in this model. It's all the activities that occur to empower the patient to make the best decisions about their health. As opposed to you show up, you have a problem, we prescribe you something and then you go home and nobody follows up. So we flipped it. But he couldn't adopt this model on the adult side without a nurse case manager and without a, uh, a partner, a hematologist or a nurse practitioner who's willing to provide some of the care. You can't take care of 250 adults with one provider and expect them to have decent care. So we took the same strategy, wrote a grant, hired a nurse case manager, nurse case manager went on the adult side, not the pediatric side. She was there for three years. Oh. Once they looked at what she was doing, they said, wow, we can't afford for this person to leave. This person, anytime she went on vacation, they had the regular nurses take care of the patient, sickle, sickle, some of these. they had to have two nurses. They're like, we can't do this. So to me, you have to understand the leverage of the system. They're, the system is, is stressed, right? There's not enough resources to do everything that needs to be done. Right, and so- hey, Michael? Yes, I'm listening. Sorry, not to cut you off. This is this is Mignon Lowe. I'm, I'm just wondering if I can have a minute to address Solara's comments as well from oh, our right Seattle ahead. children. Mignon, it's please. really nice to, to see you. I'm, I'm sorry we're not in person. So, Solara, I'm the new division chief of HEMOS uh, BMT and Cellular Therapies. My name's Mignon Lowe, and I came from San Francisco, and I just arrived here on December 1st, and I'm in the process of learning a lot about um, all of the services within, you know, the HEMOC purview. And I, I will tell you that there is a lot of effort ongoing to improve and coalesce the care um, for sickle cell patients in strong collaboration with Shaquita Bell and the Odessa Brown Clinic. Um, and we had actually arranged for a very large summit and external advisory board meeting on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday this week. Um, and unfortunately, we had to postpone that uh, because of the Omicron surge. So we're actually delaying it until the beginning of April. But um, regardless, I, you know, I welcome your input. I have a lot of um, opinions about this as well. I'm very invested in uh, ensuring that there is equity for our populations. Uh, and um, and I have a meeting um, that either has been scheduled or is being scheduled with one of your chief residents, and I would welcome you to reach out to them and join that meeting. I'm happy to talk to the residents. So I haven't had a chance to meet the residency class yet, but I, I'm happy to do so. So I'll stop there because this is my own <laughs> No, I'm glad. I'm glad you know, th maybe this is a better format, right? Is that it's, let's not wait until the end and have a few questions, but let's hit, you know, a third of the way or a fifth of the way and get some input. And thanks, Mignon, I really appreciate it. So, uh, so now let me go back to the next step in my, career. So now, you know, I've been promoted from an assistant to associate professor, not because of the work that I do in the community, which is, you know, my thing, uh, but because I've been extramurally funded. And um, I ended up being associate professor of medicine, of pediatrics and biostats and uh, neurology because of my research in stroke and treatment of children and young adults with sickle cell disease. So uh, I'm still learning the status quo. And, uh, but I'm getting a little bit more frustrated. And, um, and things are going well academically. I'm hitting all the quote unquote academic benchmarks. And um, I end up making a decision uh, in 2010 when I got promoted uh, to full uh, professor and endowed chair and all that kind of fun stuff that makes life a little easier as an academician. Um, I was able to take a sabbatical. And um, when I took this sabbatical, um, it's one thing about when you take care of children when you're the intern and you see them when they're 20 years old. And uh, that transformation of this little pudgy child that you're trying to put an IV in at two o'clock in the morning, because that's the intern's job um, in 1987, 88, with Ann Hing as my senior resident saying to me, why did you not put the IV in? Do I have to put it in? No, we got it. I have it. It's in, Dr. Hing. Um, and, uh, and then seeing this young lady um, at 21. So she sent me an email. She found my email address and she sent me an email. And essentially the essence of this email was, uh, Dr. DeBond, um, I'm, doing, I'm trying to do the right thing. 
I've done everything you've asked me to do. I know my drugs. I know the medication I'm taking. I know my short-acting pain medication. I know my long-acting pain medication. I'm on my hydroxyurea, and despite doing all of this, I am uh, still in pain. Can you recommend an internist that I can see that will help me um, get over this disease? Now, you know, when you're in these type of long-term relationships with your patients, you have to actually start to think, and I had a lot of time to think on my sabbatical, like wh why is this system that we have created is nuts. I spent 20 years of my life devoted to this young lady, understanding all the nuances of her disease. Uh, she's in one of our education remediation stroke programs because she had a son and stroke. And not only that, my wife had tutored her. We knew, we, I know her. And at some arbitrarily date, arbitrary date, I'm supposed to turn her over to an internist who has a different philosophy of care uh, because she said her birthday. And I said, all right, I'm, I'm not feeling this. I don't think this is the right way to do this. There has to be a better way to take care of this patient population, these children and adults across the lifespan. And then understanding the pathophysiology of the disease and knowing that the antecedents of many of the complications in the adult disease occur in children. You know, there are two-year-olds with hyperfiltration with sickle cell disease, two years with hyperfiltration. We rarely see in a, a child with uh, chronic kidney disease stage three or four. Rarely see a child, we don't even see a child with five with in stage renal disease. And yet you go on the adult side, you can see it in 12% of the adults have uh, individuals with, 12% uh, of adults have stage three chronic kidney disease, 12%. And if you have in stage renal disease, Guess what? You die within uh, 20, you have a 26% rate of death within 12 months of your diagnosis of end stage renal disease if you have sickle cell disease. 26%. This is published data. We published actually on my sabbatical. So I said, hey, we have to do better than this. I need to understand the adult disease. The adults need to understand the pediatric disease, and we need to have crosstalk. We're in the room together. No different than if you have, if you're an oncologist and you're taking care of lymphoma and you have the spectrum of lymphoma across the lifespan and you're in a tumor board and you talk about that spectrum of lymphoma across the lifespan uh, so that you can all learn together. And so that was my decision to, to change my course. That was my midlife crisis. So despite being in St. Louis for, I'm, I'm a native St. Louis, soon my wife is a native St. Louis and I, from my, high school. I could see my high school every day I went to work. Um, uh, my mother-in-law was in her 80s. Um, she was the last of our four parents. Um, my wife took her out to the movies every week. My brother-in-law came over to the house every Sunday and we watched football games together. I mean, I had the perfect life. We were actually picking out our burial grounds. Um, I said, I can't do it. I, I can do better than what is set up. So I didn't even negotiate about how can I change a wash you model into this uh, comprehensive model of care that I wanted to institute, integrated model of care. And um, I ended up uh, going to Vanderbilt. I only had three conditions on my uh, decision to leave. And it was a tough decision. I wrestled with this decision and my wife wrestled with it even more. Um, and ultimately uh, we ended up coming here to Vanderbilt. The only three conditions, were, number one, we would, uh, uh, allow me to set up a clinic in a location very similar to Odessa Brown, um, at FQHC. Uh, and the reason I wanted to go to an FQHC is because I wouldn't have the, the uh, payer uh, challenge of, do you have Medicaid? Do you not have Medicaid? Uh, do you have Blue Cross? Do you not have Blue Cross? And I wanted the care to be integrated with primary care providers because all the data that we have ever known about sickle cell disease is that primary care is, is as essential as the subspecialty care. And I, I didn't want to compete with Meharry, uh, which was the uh, second component. And then the third was it had to include adult providers uh, or people who took care of adults. So we set up a clinic in, at uh, Matthew Walker and FQHC. I, I must tell you that most people didn't know what those acronyms stood for when I started going on my interview trail for the three sites. I was like, what's an FQHC? Why do you want to be an FQHC? What's the big deal about the FQHC? So I had to explain that, which was important for everybody to get buy-in. And um, I ended up 
uh, moving the clinic um, to times that were uh, amendable to people who were uh, working adults. Um, and that meant that we had to have clinic on Saturdays and we had to have clinic in the evening. And I must tell you that this was not um, welcomed at all. And when I uh, made the announcement that the clinic would be in Tuesday evenings and uh, two Saturdays a month, uh, literally um, within six months of that decision, the other hematologist who was managing the patients with sickle cell disease quit. The nurse coordinator quit. And um, the social worker who wasn't actually assigned to patients with sickle cell disease, but were part of the division of hematology oncology. So she was still in that reactionary model that had been set up at St. Louis Children's Hospital. She quit as well, probably unrelated, but she didn't have anything to do with our patients. So, um, I had kind of a moment of clarity of here I want to start a program and uh, service our children and young adults and adults with this disease. And uh, I was leading with nobody behind me. And um, it was actually a fortunate grace uh, because what ended up happening was I was able to hire a nurse case manager who embraced this concept of the Ed Wagner uh, chronic care model, um, practicing at her highest level of proficiency, uh, and uh, the integrate myself into the clinic. Uh, that integration into the FQHC is, 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 has both good news and some news that's um, less pleasant. Um, it was a great uh, decade long run. We ended up uh, delivering asthma care in that same location with a full PFT lab. Uh, and uh, delivering uh, NHLVI guideline asthma care with a nurse practitioner who is a certified asthma uh, educator. So um, I, I want to hit pause here and talk to see if there's any questions uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes about this uh, transformation from um, my midlife crisis uh, to um, ending up at Vanderbilt and starting this FQHC uh, clinic. Um, while still integrated into the Vanderbilt uh, Tertiary Care Center. No questions. I have a question. There was one question from the earlier um, time slot that was in the chat. So I'll read that to you um, from Mike Lou. So inspiring. Is there a group of like-minded individuals such as yourself that meets together to strategize about how to identify and address issues such as these? Oh, that's a loaded question. Uh, I, I'm fortunate, you know, uh, like I said, I'm in the winter of my life. So I have uh, mentees. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that uh, the sickle cell program in San Antonio is run by a former mentee. Um, the adult program in Milwaukee, um, at Josh Field did the same, uh, took on the same strategy and dramatically dropped uh, healthcare utilization and care in Milwaukee. Um, another mentee in New York uh, by the name of Jeff uh, Glasper uh, started with me as a medical student, took a year out as a first, as a third year medical student to work in my lab, focusing on asthma. And um, he decided that he needed to go back to New York. He's a native New Yorker and uh, ended up uh, uh, going into emergency medicine. And we uh, truly navigated a, a strategy for him to go from NYU to Mount Sinai. And now Jeff is uh, the director of the sickle cell program at Mount Sinai. And uh, you know, they are all, we are all like-minded in the fact of our um, focus on children and adults with sickle cell disease. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention Allison King, who is uh, at uh, Wash U. And she was actually my first mentee in 1996. And she is uh, extremely well-funded. She's a tenure professor at uh, Wash U uh, and focuses on educational attainment. Uh, she has a PhD, not only, uh, she has, she's an MD with board certified in pediatric chemo, but she went, she's so focused on this education remediation and acquired injury to the brain of children, uh, and, uh, particularly children with sickle cell disease with silent infarction and reverse strokes. She went out and got a PhD in education and is doing some wonderful work on um, education remediation in children and adults with sickle cell disease and better defining neurological complications of adults with sickle cell disease. So there are some folks out there who, who think like I do, or I think like they do. They, they have, uh, there's been reciprocity in um, our laboratory uh, where I continue to gain strength and knowledge um, from uh, former mentees. Um, 
that's basically where I spend my time is with the people that I've worked with. Um, so that's a short, that's maybe not the right answer, but it's, it's the truthful answer. So I, I want to move forward to the last uh, journey in my life, uh, then getting to my winter season. Um, you know, I had the pleasure, I have a friend here in Nashville. His name is Adetola Kassim. He happens to be the adult hematologist and a, he's a transplant physician. And, you know, there's something about having a friend or a wife, a true friend uh, and a wife that says, you know, hey, you, got, you have some blind spots. And despite my energy to try to improve the life of children and adults with sickle cell disease with, with um, research and advancing the care and being an advocate in this space for them as well, um, Adetola said, Mike, um, you're good and you are celebrated, blah, 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 but you have no footprint in Nigeria, zero. And uh, dude, half of all children in the world are born in Nigeria with sickle cell disease. How can you call yourself an expert and you have no, you don't even know what it looks like there. So, um, you know, it just needs a moment of reflection to say, you're right. If you have aspirations to have an imprint on improving people's lives and um, you're not having an impact where 50% of the children with sickle cell disease in the world are born, maybe not so much of a big impact. And so I had tried previously to get to Nigeria with multiple different approaches, but in this particular case, I was more successful. So keep trying when you fail and because um, eventually you might be successful. So I took a, a road trip and I'll make this long road trip of 10 days uh, into uh, hopefully three minutes. And the condition of this road trip, you know how it is when you're in the academic physician, they send you on this, you know, dog and pony show, you stop at every location, you get in a grand round, you, you know, you give your spell, and then you get back in the car, and you have a nice dinner, and then you get up and do it again. So I had like this itinerary, that that's what, what I was supposed to do for like, nine days in Nigeria. I met all kinds of folks. And I said, I agree to do this dog and pony show if and only if I'm taking my wife and I take my daughter. And at the end of this trip, we have this um, camp for girls with sickle cell disease. Retreat on a Saturday and a Sunday. And if you agree to that, I'll agree to, to come to Nigeria. So they did. And I thought, you know, I had done my work for eight days. And the ninth and the tenth day, I was off. So my daughter and my wife, who had been putting on the arts and crafts for this homemade camp that we put together in St. Louis for a decade, they'd been doing that for a decade. My daughter was like all of the second grade when she started doing arts and crafts for this camp. And Baba and his wife and his daughter, they did the, they did the uh, camp. But it turns out that the families came in for that weekend. They, the moms and the dads were not gonna leave their daughters with some foreigners. So they stayed. So. You know, my wife comes back Saturday night and says, uh, you don't have Sunday off. Uh, you have to entertain the parents because otherwise the parents are mucking up the system and we can't have any fun with the girls and really allow them to express themselves. So uh, I said, okay. So now what do I do with parents for six hours? Because the camp was eight hours and at the last two hours there's a big feast of food and a, a play that the girls put on. So I had to entertain the parents. So I did the typical, you know, parent education program that we had set up in St. Louis, taught them how to feel for the spleen, taught them how to take a thermometer, taught them, taught them the Wong Baker faces for pain, and then had question and answers. And during that question and answer period, one of the parents described a child with a stroke. And nobody knew what a stroke was. We'll make a long story short, out of the 42 girls that were at that camp that day, six had a stroke and we made the diagnosis for the first time. And the impact of knowing that those girls had a stroke for the first time was significant for not only myself, but everybody who was with us and the families. And so literally, we, and this was August of 2011. Um, fast forward now for the last uh, decade, uh, we wrote uh, multiple grants, got funded for a feasibility trial, got funded for a randomized controlled trial to prevent strokes with children with sickle cell disease that was just published in uh, Lancet Hematology. Uh, we set up a program with the state governments in Northern Nigeria, three state governments, uh, where literally we asked the state governments after the completion of the trials that they would provide the hydroxyurea free of charge. These three state governments have more children with sickle cell disease than the entire United States. So over 40,000 children with sickle cell disease in these three states. 
Hano Casino in, in uh, Kaduna. Uh, they now provide hydroxyurea free of charge for children with high, uh, elevated TCD, and they are initially treated with uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram for hydroxyurea because we've now demonstrated that that is sufficient to prevent strokes, which is similar to uh, initial transfusions. And um, the program is sustainable, independent, and after the cessation of the uh, three trials that we have set up there. Um, and we have a, have a mentee in Kaduna who has a K43, which is equivalent to a K23, uh, to take the strategy that we utilize to integrate our approach with primary stroke prevention, integration with the state, uh, free hydroxyurea, tracking of the children with abnormal TCDs and abnormal and with strokes um, as a implementation uh, K43. And her mentor is uh, Allison King, um, my former mentee and now colleague at WashU. So um, I just want to end there and uh, let you know that I uh, appreciate the time. Uh, thanks for the flexibility. Um, uh, just a gentle reminder that only 5% of all children born with sickle cell disease live in high-income countries. High -income countries. So, so when people start telling you this rhetoric about how gene therapy is going to cure sickle cell disease, um, just look at the numbers, okay? And 70%, uh, 75% are in Africa. In the clinics that I um, provided uh, support to with research and infrastructure and uh, uh, training, um, uh, some of those clinics didn't even have uh, thermometers, uh, didn't have pulse oximetry, didn't have uh, blood pressure cuffs. So the idea that we're going to treat this population with gene therapy, uh, I, I'll let you be the judge. Those are just the facts. All right, thank you. I'm I'm happy to stay on the call to take additional uh, questions. I, I probably took up more time than I should have with ad lib comments and uh, editorial comments. So um, thanks for being here. Hey, Michael, this has been um, just a joy, you know, working with you and getting to know you over these years and having you come and kind of sense, uh, give your wisdom to this group as we begin on our journey to have more comprehensive uh, activism and comprehensive sickle cell uh, care here. It's, it's a joy. I just have to say thank you. The way you tie your uh, scientific uh, inquiry to your activism, to your uh, community work is something that uh, all of us uh, can aspire to. So just thank you. And it's great thank to you. see you. Look forward to seeing you in April. I look forward to being there in April. I'm happy to, to meet with whoever uh, you and Minglo set me up to meet with. And I hope you have the opportunity to look at some of the comments in the chat because there's a, just a lot of um, really, really nice comments for you. As, oh, wow. I didn't, I, I'm so focused on the screen. I'm like, oh, I'm going to give a talk without a PowerPoint. Maybe it was, maybe it was better to have not have the PowerPoint. I, I don't know. You have to give that me some feedback. That worked out great. Just yeah. take a moment to look through the chat comments. Um, we'll leave this line open so that you can do that. But this ends our hour for Grand Rounds. I know some other lucky people get to meet with Dr. Debon today, but thank you so much, um, Dr. Bell and Dr. Debon and everyone who's been on this Grand Rounds. This is a really, really good one.